languages and civilizations, or you might say ethnic groups in this world, know there's a creator, and they have it in their legends, they have it in their history, they know there's a creator, and, and 95% of them even have a name for him, 5%, and they're down in what is called Oceania, that's down there in the New Hebrides in the Southwest Pacific, here in Gyra, it is now called, which used to be New Guinea. They know there's a God, but they forgot his name. Forgot his name. And all of them, by the way, have a code of moral ethics. Very, very similar, not exact, but very close to the Ten Commandments. Very close. Otherwise, God has those people out there he has a message, he has a gospel that prepares, that is prepared to reach them, and even speaking to them through nature has their hearts and, and through their culture prepared for the gospel. What's the problem? Taking it to them and understanding it so we can take it to them. You know, the gospel is like anything else. If you're going to teach a dog, you've got to know more than the dog. I'm amazed at the people that want to go out and be missionaries and don't have the slightest idea what God is trying to do in the book. Most people's idea is that God gave us this book to get people to agree to go to heaven. No, that's not the purpose of it at all. The purpose of it is to get our mind enlightened to how wonderful God is and how right and reasonable and intelligent His ways are and how stupid our ways are of sin and selfishness and to get our minds enlightened so that we will want to turn from that and turn to Christ for forgiveness and transformation. Otherwise, the reason for it is, the I main is to get man reconciled to God. When? Now. Not when we're dead. Now. Now, to be reconciled or to reconcile means this, to be restored to favor. means to adjust your differences. If here is a man and wife getting divorced, and if I get them reconciled, what have I gotten them to do? I've gotten them to, to adjust their difference. And, and by the way, somebody's got to change in the process. And I, uh, the ones I've tried to get reconciled, and sometimes I have, I usually found both sides had to change. Now, if you're going to be reconciled to God, somebody's got to change. Who do you think it is? God. I am the Lord, I change not. So, man, there has to be an enlightening process in the human mind so man can see himself as he really is. So God can save him from himself. himself. You know, if God hasn't saved us from ourselves, he certainly hasn't saved us from hell. Now, we've been talking about moral government for several nights here and sessions. And we talked about physical government a lot, but this morning we're going to talk about how God governs that which is free. Now we find that Adam and Eve were made with the right attitude and disposition of heart. That dictated to them how they ought to act and react in every given situation. That's why they didn't have the Ten Commandments in the garden. God did give them one teeny weeny law. Very lenient. Just as he, they be, let God be God and man be man. You can't give a half a law. Isn't that lean? Where do they get the idea that God of the Old Testament is hard and rigid and burdensome and that, that he's a terrible creature? Oh, no. They don't get that from the Bible, wherever they get it. There's a lot of things in theology today that when you get those people and you get them where the hair short, they'll admit they don't get it from the Bible. Did you know the Catholic Church now has three books out against original sin? Three of them. They're even getting delivered from that. But the fundamentalists and evangelicals will get delivered about 30 years after the Catholics. <laughs> but there will always be some guy come out of the woodwork and go, but Brother Con, like I did, I was speaking in a big charismatic church one Sunday night, and I was showing him. How do you expect to get people guilty before God and lost? And you tell them they're born a sinner and they can't help it. And I went in to show them the fallacies of 
original sin, I thought, oh, Harry, you've done it. Man, they've all turned you off. They've gone home already, but they're still sitting there. <laughs> I said, these are a bunch of Schofield Bible. I said, Do they think the notes are inspired. <laughs> they'd never heard of the black preacher. That the, his deacon gave him a Bible for Christmas, a Schofield Bible. Came back about two months later, Pastor, how do you like that Bible he gave you for Christmas? He said, well, the Bible sure throws a lot of light on them notes. <laughs> well, we find that when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they died. They died spiritually. But they were lost that rather right attitude and that disposition of heart. They lost it. <coughs> Now, they were born with an intuitive knowledge of right and wrong, and man is today even yet. That's what the Bible means in John 1, 3. This is a light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man 30 years of age would know that there's a moral code if he hadn't been educated away from it. Uh, the greatest indictment I have against higher education today is they are educating people away from their common sense. That ought not to be, friends. It is designed, education is to sharpen and develop and direct it where we can work on the problems of this world and one another's and help one another, not to be educated away from our common sense. By the way, I don't like the phrase common sense because I don't think there's ever been so much of it it became common. <laughs> it's like that old stupid statement, horse sense. I've taken the old course that we proved that the dumbest of all animals is a horse. So if you want horse sense, you can have it. I'd rather have mule myself. <laughs> yeah, horse sense. Oh, it's, we had certain experiments we put them through which, to show you a horse but the only thing he knows is the way to the barn at night. <laughs> of course, there's some dumb men that don't know that. <laughs> now, they lost that right attitude and disposition of heart. One day, as I told you the other night, Moses got an invitation from God. And he went and he told his Hebrew brothers about it. That he had an invitation from God to come, on, to come up on Sinai. And here's what they said. Go down near and hear all. This is Deuteronomy 5, 27. Go down near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say and speak unto us. All that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee. And we will hear it and do it. They knew God was so right, so reasonable, so loving, so intelligent, that he'd never give them anything to do that they couldn't do or that he wouldn't enable them to do. So then, we find this, when he came down from Sinai with the Ten Commandments, you want to get this straight? We're getting in at something here, you'll never understand the moral law of God and where it fits for the Christian in this age. Unless you get a hold of what I'm talking about. When he came down from Sinai with the Ten Commandments on the two tablets of stone, the first four are between ourselves and God, and the last six are horizontal between one and another. Man-to-man -man relationship and God-to-man relationship. Now, friends, the Ten Commandments did not create our obligation to God or to one another. They merely defined what they always had been and they always will be. Just define it. This is we would say in business, but God put it down in writing. In writing. So, I turn over one page in my Bible to Deuteronomy 6, 24 and 25, and listen to this. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded. 
Is there any particular phrase that jumped out at you from that 24th verse? There's one that's jumped out at me now for, for, our, for, for several our, decades. What? For our good. That's right. For our good. Never meant to harm you. Never meant to rob you of anything good or right or wholesome or reasonable. But for our good. Now, my friends, the Ten Commandments are ex an expression of the mind of God. When you start criticizing the Ten Commandments, you're criticizing the mind of God. Whenever you say, oh, it's a relic of the Old Testament, you're criticizing God. And when you say man can't keep the Ten Commandments, you're telling God he was an arbitrary lawmaker that didn't know what he was doing. Because the Ten Commandments are made in perfect accord with our nature. You get that? In perfect accord with our nature. There's a great subject. It, it isn't taught anymore. But I was instrumental in getting that book republished. And you folks, if you ever see it around, you want to get it. It's called Edmund Burke and Natural Law. Edmund Burke and Natural Law. <clears throat> now, my friends, the Ten Commandments, when it says, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not kill or murder with malice, that doesn't make it wrong. It's in the Bible because it is wrong. You see that? When I tell you in this manual for this car that I have designed, thou shalt not drive this car without four quarts of oil in the transmission. That doesn't make it wrong. I've got it in the, in the manual because it is wrong, and that's the way I've designed it. It's designed to run on oil. That doesn't mean I'm hard, I'm burdensome, I'm oppressive to that mechanism, does it? But it means that I know how to design it, and I put that lubrication in it so it'll run right and run a long time and do what it was designed and created to do. Is that right? Well, that's the way the blessed Ten Commandments are, my friends. And she says, for our good always. And I showed you, like that yellow line up over the hill on the two-lane highway around the curve. When you see that and you're driving your car, you don't get mad and say, oh, the governor and that state highway department are inhibiting me. I can let it go. This jaguar, this duster, as I said here the other night, maybe some of you drive the Hitler's Revenge. That's a Volkswagen. You don't look at that yellow line and get mad, do you? You don't if you've got all the ball bearings God intended for you to have. You look at that and you stay on your side of the road because it's for your good. It's for those good coming over the hill, those behind you, those riding with you. And that's the way the wonderful Ten Commandments are. As he says, it might preserve you alive as at this day and that yellow line will preserve you. If you've got enough sense to obey it. If you haven't, then you, you take your chances. You take your chances. Now I turn on my Bible to the 10th chapter. And I'm going to read you the 12th and 13th. Now listen to this. 10th chapter of Deuteronomy, 10th and 12th verses. The 12th and 13th, I beg your pardon. Now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Praise jump out there at you again. For thy good. I started young, I was about 12 years of age in a machine shop working for my daddy. I piloted a broom <laughs> and a scoop shovel that weighed about half as much as I did. And once in a long, great while, I'd get ahead of the job. It was like painting a Brooklyn Bridge. Started here, and the time you got over there, here you go start all over again. You know what I mean? But as I got a little bigger and a little stronger, my dad would take me over to a machine where men were making piston rings. And he'd take one of the machines, and he'd act like I was the only person in the whole world. He'd sit there and show me. He took the knowledge from his mind, put it in my poor little brain, 
skill from his hand, put up my hand, and I was making this for him before I ever got out of junior high school. He said, hey, this person's getting dirty. Back on the road. <laughs> he didn't like dirt. Well, I think my, maybe in a couple of days I get a help. Come on, son, I'm going to show you now how to make pistons. And he would take me like I'm the only person in the world and take me to a machine. Now, while he was showing me how to make one, he could have made 30. <laughs> but I was his son. Now, he didn't do this with any of the other men in the place. They had a job, and they said they are doing it all day, but I was his son. And let me get this straight. I was in a right relationship. I was in happy obedience and submission. You get that? I like to say that I'm in happy submission to Christ. I'm not grinding at it. I'm not straining at it. I'm not holding on to the end. Because I know the end of the rope's got a great big knot in it. <laughs> now, that's the way I was in my daddy's shop. So, over a period of years, he took out of his mind and he put in my mind. So, that there came a time in later in my life that I was not only a con by being born that way, genetically or physically, I became a con because I could think like my daddy. I could act, I could solve problems like he could. You know, at 33 years old, before I was comfortable with the name con, my daddy made the first automobile ever in my hometown in India. I don't mean he bought a do-it-yourself kit. He designed it, he made the patterns. The only thing he didn't do himself was pour the cast iron. That isn't hard to do. But he made it. My dad had lots of inventions. I had four brothers who became chief engineer. When I married my wife, I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I don't want you to think I'm as, I'm as smart and brilliant as other convoys. Oh, no. I, I graduated in the upper 95% of my class. And I'm, you know, not the upper five. <laughs> And I said, well, I, don't, I really, I want to be very honest with her. But I got had more problems than problems. I'd take them home today until I was 35 years old. I had them people turn over to me, imagine, making a complete Caterpillar tractor, 18 tons, but we couldn't get them on black guy. But I'd been a troubleshooter, and they'd Wherever they had trouble, the International Harvester of 110,000 employees, that's why they sent me. I'd look at the problems, write them down, listen to these guys, and then tear for home. <laughs> <laughs> ah, tear for home. I began to see later in life what God meant when he says, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. That's not just witnessing, that's taking all our problems to life to him. All our problems in life. Sure, it means witnessing. I witnessed to tens of thousands of the engineers and scientists of the saving grace of Jesus. That's involved in it. But I think that's a secondary meaning of that. To acknowledge him in all our ways, all our problems, all the areas of our life. When he does, then you begin to think like him. Then you begin to act like him. But you've got to get to thinking first and the acting second. Act in second. Most of us, we want to get the feeling first. No, you can have feeling without the facts. We get the facts, you can get the feeling. Nobody has to pump you up on Sunday morning either. I was speaking in New York City for the American Management Association in 1958. And I'll tell you, when you go in one of their conferences where they charge men 500 bucks to come in and sit down and listen to you, they don't set you up there and speak, hoping you can speak. You get in there a couple days early and you go through a dry run. If you don't know how to speak, they're going to teach you. If they can't teach you, you're not going to speak. So the seven or eight of us get in there two or three days before and they say, all right, come, go through your lecture. Well, I've been preaching on street corners. I preached maybe a thousand times in, in rescue missions and in about uh, 50 different denominational churches, so I wasn't exactly greenhorn in speaking. And I also had study speech at the University of Chicago. So I gave mine. They said, that's enough, brother. We, can, we know experience when we see it and hear it. You can, your excuse, you don't need to go through. But some of these other guys here, oh, they got all kinds of rough edges. We got to knock off them. 
So I sat out there, because several of these are my friends, and I didn't have any tavern or any place I wanted to go in New York City, having escaped from there four years previously, having lived there, you know. I'm sitting out there, and I'm beginning to think on the atonement, Brother Bob, and what the Spirit of God will reveal to me about Jesus' great love and dying for me. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking on the atonement. One time, a guy comes to me and looks at me in tears, running down. I said, what's the matter, Brother Con? You got an emotional problem? I said, not one. Oh, leave me alone. I'm in heaven right now. <laughs> Leave me alone. Ah, uh, you didn't need to pump me up. Yeah. No, the blessed truth that God made real to this poor heart by the Holy Spirit to do that. Ah. Uh, so which I command thee this day for thy good. Now, please turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah 1. third verse of Isaiah 1. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. You ever hear the expression to say the guy's dumber than an ox? <laughs> That's where it comes from. That's why Woodrow Wilson used to say, if you haven't read the Bible too, you're not an educated person, because we use Bible expressions so much in the United States, you don't know what they mean if you haven't read the Bible. Otherwise, he's saying, the ox knows his owner, and he asks his master's crib. But Israel does not know my people, does not consider, he's saying, they're dumb and oxen. They're rebellion. He's saying, an ah, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors, they've forsaken the Lord, they've provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, and they are gone backwards. Now look, look at the consequences. Why will you be stricken anymore? You revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the soles of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been clothed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Practically, Israel as a nation is on skid row, a wino. Ah, but turn, if you will, over to the 18th verse. <coughs> now we're going to get in to see how more government works. Come now, let us reason together. Otherwise, a thing, like that prodigal son in the pig pen, says he came to his senses. That means he began to think. And by the way, I want to digress here for just a moment. About five years ago, Harvard came out with a report that said our penitentiaries are a failure. They do not rehabilitate the criminals. <laughs> I read this and I said, turn I said, anybody study the atonement? Two hours done no better than this. The purpose of penitentiaries is not to rehabilitate. It's to restrain and restrict those people that don't want to treat their fellow man right. It, it, they are to be sanctions for the law of our land. If you don't obey them, this is what you get. Because if you don't have this is what you get, you don't have a law, you just got advice. Law without sanctions is not law, it's just advice. So they said they don't rehabilitate. Now, friends, Whenever you put the prefix before a word like re, resurrection, or refine, now uh, that means what follows, you're going to redo that again. Resurrection would mean you're going to bring back to life, but there had to be been life there in the first place. Now, so if you're going to rehabilitate something, it must have been habilitated in the first place. Now, what does habilitate mean? Well, Back to the turn of the century, when Amundsen tried to go to the North Pole, carry to places like that, if you had hired me to habilitate that expedition, that would mean 
My job was to outfit them. It was to get them the equipment of, say, dog teams, carcass, have trained dogs, compass sextants, teach them how to shoot the sun and figure out where they are. That's habilitating them and teach them how to live in weather that's very, very cold and how to live off the land. That's habilitate. To habilitate means to equip, to outfit. Ah, but that can be in the physical meaning, but also the moral meaning. It means to teach them how to get along with one another. There was a fellow in my hometown went with one of those, and they ran out of food, and you know what they did with him? They ate him. His body came back. They thought it was very, way very likely. It was nothing but a skeleton. They'd run out of food, and they, they ate this man. His name was Whistler, from my hometown, buried down there in Indiana. They hadn't been habilitated right. Now, to habilitate means to equip, but one of two ways. It can be mechanically or physically, second, morally. All right, now, how do you expect a bunch of chaplains in a penitentiary that don't even believe the Bible is the Word of God, how do you expect them to get a bunch of criminals rehabilitated that were never habilitated by their parents or by a church in the first place? How do you expect people to rehabilitate criminals that were never habilitated? Now, friends, bless your heart, you got your children here. Sunday schools are one of the greatest places to habilitate children. And by the way, as we used to say in training in the Navy, we can teach you how to live. We can't make you live right, but we can sure make you wish you had it. <laughs> you get that? Well, that same thing is true about the Bible. The Bible will teach you how to live. It can't make you live that way because you're a free will creature. But if you read this Bible, you'll soon come to the day when you wish you had it. You wish you had it. All right? Now, if you habilitate your children, there's no guarantee they're going to make them. But I'm going to tell you something about it. If you habilitate them, they can be like that prodigal son who got his, his inheritance and went to far land and dissipated and blew the money and riotous living and wound up in the pig pen. And down there, he's even eaten husk with the pig. And came to, he came to his senses. Now that means he must have had some sense before that, but threw it away. Because his daddy had habilitated him as a young man. So when he came to his senses, what did he do? Arise and go to my father's house and start living intelligent instead of like an animal. Instead of like an animal. See, if he hadn't been habilitated, there'd been no chance of getting back. So if you habilitate your children, that doesn't mean they're never going to get in trouble, but it does mean this. They'll have 20 times a better chance of being rehabilitated than a guy was never habilitated. Never have a Sunday school is not the only place. It should be done in the home. It should be done every day. By the way, many times at our dinner table, when my children are home, we pick a commandment out and start talking about how right, how reasonable, how intelligent, how needful, how practical, how universal. A wonderful commandment we were talking about. Not all of them, just that one. Boy, you get to know them then. Like I taught my wife soon after we met, I said, honey, I don't want you to love me with all your heart. If you do, you get cheated. I want you to love God with all your heart. Because you become like that which you love with all your heart. My goodness, imagine loving me with all the heart. Wouldn't that good? Do you think short change? <laughs> Gee, man, what a terrible thing. Yet, man, some men want women like that. And I said, honey, if you love me with all your heart, one of day I'll lay down and die like a dog and you'll have a dead God. A dead God. And by the way, a lot of w women have loved their daughters like a God, it's been their God, and then when they get married, uh -huh, they can't stay on, they got to go over there, and that's why we got more of them, mother-in-law jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of truth in them. 
Because her little god got up and left. See what I mean? She has to go trotting after. Oh, no, my dear friend. When God, he didn't say, thou shalt not be an atheist. He said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, everybody in the world has a god. What God, through the Bible, is trying to do is to get us to have the right god. There was a time in my life when baseball was my god. I got to the place where I could play baseball for a living and make good money, and it lost all attraction. Then I discovered girls. <laughs> and there's millions of young men today man, in our country that got us girls, right? And then they discover a new car. Maybe they get a Jaguar or a Duster. You could say anything about the girlfriend or the mother, but don't you put a nick on that car. Because <laughs> that's their God. Everybody has a God. Everybody. But God said it. Don't you have another one because that will break your heart, it will ruin you, it will repeat the fulfillment in your life. And that may be perfectly legal, what it is, nothing wrong with it, if it's in the right place in your life. You see what I mean? I've known farmers that their farms was their gods. And when they died, you know how much of they left? Every acre. Every acre. She couldn't take any of it with them. I did come to the place where these things eventually they don't satisfy and just living for yourself that's why we get all of the I think I won't say quite all of them the suicide because they lose their attraction and then never having lived for the glory of God to glorify him to love our fellow so this old purpose of life over here of selfishness loses its attraction never having been over here they, that's why you get suicide now, listen to this. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. Look what he's saying. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. If you refuse and rebel, ye shall be the bar for the sword. Which you want. Who's it up to what we get in this life? God or us? It's us. Now turn, if you will, back to Matt, back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28. And here's one of the most amazing things when you read this. The first 15 verses, God has told the Israelites, if you'll do this, this, and this, you're going to get all of these wonderful consequences. He says, start there, the first 15 verses, and it shall come to pass if thou hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee, if thou hearken unto the voice of the Lord our God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks. Of thy sheep, blessed shall be the basket. Otherwise, he's saying, if you obey me, look at all these good consequences are going to come. Ah, but if you don't, now turn to the 15th verse. 15. But if you don't, it shall come to pass, if thou not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field, and cursed shall be the fat. See the exact opposite. Now this doesn't mean that God put curses on them. This is by virtue of the way he has created man. Now turn over, if you will, to the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. Now, I won't read all that what we just said, but that gives you a good sample of it. Now look at the 19th verse. Here is Moses out on this Judean hillside. And he says this to the Israelites, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing, cursing. 
Therefore choose life, that both I and thou and thy seed may what? Live. So who is it up to? Is it up to God or is it up to man? Now I'm going to show you some slides here after a while of some people that didn't choose to do that way. And God doesn't have to do it to us. He doesn't. Because what he's saying here is made in perfect accord with our nature. Now, do you remember? I said, now this is the way he governs man. He gets some knowledge into us through the truth of the blessed word of God, through the persuasion of preaching and teaching, the love of Christ, the love of parents, and the influence of the blessed Holy Spirit, enlightening the mind, convicting us of our sins. No cause and effect here. Get it in their mind. So then, with this law, or these responsibilities, and by the way, every responsibility you have in this life has sanctions with them, or consequences. If you fulfill your responsibilities in obedience to God, you'll find that the rewards are peace, their joy, their life, their freedom, and so forth. Now, friends, I've got to really warn you about something here, because many of this is going to become very handy to you. When the unconverted man begins to get his mind enlightened, the Spirit of God begins to convict him of his sin. He, his disobedience has brought him here, but he sees this and he wants over here, if he's got any sense. But you, you don't get from here to there by force of resolution. You get from here to there by coming to Christ and his cross for forgiveness and transformation. And now this becomes as natural to man as this was over here. He doesn't have to grind it at either. It's a joy to do it, huh? But there's something great that happens here. Sigmund Freud says the Christians, the only reason they keep the Ten Commandments and they don't steal to this is they don't want the terrible consequences. So he said, Christianity is nothing but an enlightened self-interest. Well, I can show you that's not true. I'll show you how God has built that in. So that wouldn't be true. When we come to the cross of Christ, we don't only come for forgiveness. We come to submit for transformation. Otherwise, for sanctification. Sanctification, my friends, is a condition of justification. Otherwise, you're coming to be converted, not just to be forgiven, but to present yourself to God to do with the seemeth right with thee. But from this day on, your life is being consecrated as far as you're concerned to serving Christ and your fellow man and God. No picnic you're getting into. No, it doesn't mean that. All right, now when we come to the cross for forgiveness and transformation, there's something that starts there. Sure, salvation is instantaneous. The way you say it in Greek, it's in the aorist tense. And this is in the aorist tense. You come up here and bang, you fall off like, like that. No process. It's come up here, a climactic action. Ah, but now, this thing that we have here, consecration or sanctification, means just up to the light that you have. You're willing to obey what light you have. By the way, God doesn't show you everything about yourself while he's convicting you and me of our sin. If he did, we'd die of despair. <laughs> we'd never make it to Calvary. He reserves some of that later. And then he begins to point that out in our, in our life. And if it doesn't go, that becomes a stone in our life, as we see in the first parable. But now, here's something wonderful that begins the process there. Salvation, not a process. But sanctification is. It's climactic and it's progressive in all our lives. So, Titus 3, 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, what? By the washing and regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from sin. Ah, but where did this sin come from? The old selfish heart. So, there he says, By the washing and regeneration, and that signifies that the Holy Spirit of God, when we come to Christ in conversion, now he begins a cleansing process, not just on the sin, the blood of Christ will take care of it, now a cleansing process on the self, selfish motives of the heart. 
washing always signifies a cleansing, that a washing every generation. And a renewing the Holy Ghost, and that word renewing there means renovate, cleaning up the mind. See, you don't ever act wrong until you think wrong. You don't act right until you think right. But when we come to the cross, the blessed Holy Spirit then begins it. So now then, he cleans up our motives, and like I've told tens of thousands of engineers, it's so wonderful to be saved in happy submission to Jesus Christ. I've been serving now for over 40 years, and I say, gentlemen, if there were no hell to shun, nor any heaven to gain, I'd serve him another thousand years just because of the right, the reasonableness, the intelligence of it. And he deserves to be obeyed, and my fellow man, he deserves to be treated right. So now I'm not doing it to get to heaven. I'm doing it out of gratitude to Jesus Christ. Now the rightness, the reasonableness, and this is what I was originally created for. And by the way, you remember I told you we lost that right attitude. Adam did when he sinned, and we did when we sinned. Now, what does the Bible say? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new what? New creation. God's Spirit begins right there to recreate that right attitude and that right disposition that Adam and Eve had before they were lost. Begins it right there at Calvary. So now then, we begin to see the law of God is not hard, not burdensome, not rigid. And by virtue of our right, right relationship with Jesus in happy, humble submission to him, we begin to keep the law without even being aware of it. You get that? Now, if you're a Christian, you're breaking law this morning. That shows you your relationship with Jesus is now faulty, and you better get to the altar and get it patched up. Because sin shall not have dominion over you. For it's not under law, system, or regulation, but under grace, a right relationship. And grace is not the right to do as you please, it's the ability to do what you ought to do. Because now the Spirit of God has been recreating that right attitude and that right disposition of heart. So now it becomes a part of us. And it is not, as Freud says, enlightened self-interest. Because I found myself broke many times. I, I've been saved. If it was self-interest, it sure wasn't financial interest. <laughs> and by the way, I never had to beg. God has taken care of me so many times. I had a friend of mine, some of you might have known or heard of him, read some. He wrote the preface to my book, Four Trojan Horses. I called him one morning in Washington, D.C. He said to me, did you see that uh, documentary last night of World Vision on the poor people over in uh, Ethiopia? I said to him, he said, yes. You see, I said, yes. He said, did Bobby? I said, not a bit. He knew why it hadn't. This man has started factories in 32 countries around the world. See, around the world, the lack of food is not the problem. The lack of employment is the problem. If you can get a job anywhere in the world, get money, you can buy food. So the job is the biggest problem is unemployment. You can buy food anywhere in the world. You got this. So he being a missionary, he started companies for people to work in 32 nations around this world. My friend Paris read that. And if they can get a job, they can eat. They can feed their family. Well, he had called me up not too long before that, uh, maybe a year, and he said, Eric, I need $6,000. I need it tomorrow for this project in Africa, and it's big, you know, full flat, I don't get it. Will you give me $6,000 for the poor down there? I said, well, yes, I will. I've only got $3,000. i will give you that, and I'll go to the bank and borrow the other three. By the way, do you know many Christian people that go borrow money to give the Lord's work? Most of them I know only give what they got. That's sad. So when I saw the poor down there that weren't eating this, I didn't know have no pain to conscience. They didn't show me, didn't need to show me a little distended stomach and play on my emotion. I had no guilt because they'd given everything I had and even went to borrow to do something by. You see what I'm saying? Does that sound like enlightened self-interest? 
Freud is wrong. But we've got to know how to combat it. And I've given this to many psychologists. And they say, ooh, we have heard that part. Because when you come to Calvary, brother, just not for forgiveness, but for transformation and the cleaning up those old selfish motives of the heart and of the life. So that now then, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he be. What do you want out of life? You want that or you want this? Well, start up there. You choose to obey, this is what you'll get. Ah, but you could do that and still not be saved. You've got to come to the cross there to be forgiven and get your motives all cleaned up and get out of legalism. Then it's not legalism. I was telling Brother David that Wayne were having lunch yesterday about a there's a very, very intelligent black in this country. You should ever see a book by and by named Thomas Sowell. S O W E L F. I consider him one of the top five intellectuals in the world. Raised in Harlem, slept most of the time on a fire escape. But fought through Korea. After he got out of their service, on his GI Bill, he went through Harvard. And came back to New York, worked his way through a master's degree at Columbia. Then came to the University of Chicago and got a PhD under Milton Friedman. You ought to hear that man. And he goes after the blacks. He said, if you do go to college, you take gym class. <laughs> you don't take anything that'll make you think. You take the easiest subjects here, and then you wonder why the Chinese and the Japanese and the Jews make all the money. They take the tough subjects that'll make you think. They don't go sliding through. And you know what the blacks say about him? They say, he's not a soul brother. <laughs> he's a soul, he's a soul brother, but he, he's trying to whip them in the line. Well. I'm getting back now to moral government. I haven't forgotten in a moment. I was out to, I was given a series of lectures for a society of manufacturing engineers and their chapters, and every one of them from San Diego to Seattle, 1952. When I got to Seattle, I also had a date to speak the next night for the Christian Businessmen's yearly women's night meeting, the biggest meeting of the year for me to preach to them. I had lectured the night before. Well, friends, I made the third time that year I got to a big meeting to speak at, and I found out they'd made a mistake, and I was one of two speakers. <coughs> Whenever you have a meeting, you got two speakers, and one of them Harry you on, you can set your watch, it'll be a failure. It'll be a flop. So the other speaker was the Assembly of God pastor there, had a big church. He'd been on the Washington State Parole Board for 12 years. So I made an offer to him. I was hoping he'd refuse to make the same offer to me. I guess my heart wasn't right. And when I made him the offer, he took me up. My offer was, look, I'm just a layman. I'm from Chicago. You can have a layman like me anytime. So I'll bring him one minute greeting from Chicago and sit down and you take off, brother. He said, okay. <laughs> I hope he'd say, well, I live here in Seattle, and that's 3,000 miles away. Uh, they can have me the next month, but he didn't. I guess my heart wasn't right then. By the way, any way, shape, or form, I'm glad I gave deference to my brother because I really learned something that guy last night. Not, not about the gospel, but he talked about, friends, his 12 years in Washington State Parole Board and some of the problems. And here's what he said. Do you know we have never had a Japanese person, male or female, ever incarcerated in a Washington State penal institution? Not one. No boy, no girl, no man, no woman. He met, no reformatory, no reform school, no penal farm, no reformatory, no penitentiary. He says, I don't know why that is. He says, I think it's because of parental respect to raise with. So 30 years, about 30 years later, I'm lecturing in Walnut Creek, California. My daughter came over from Modesto to hear me. And that night after the meeting, we walked downtown in Walnut Creek, and I walked into Walden's bookstore, and here's a, here's a book by this fellow, Thomas Sowell, but that they called Ethnic America. Now, I had heard him lecture, so I, I thought, I'll get this book. I thought I knew something about America. 
until I read that book. And that black brother, he just turned me inside out. Man, he made me feel like the stupidest jerk around and loose. The things that he taught him, he just marveled. Now he said, most of us, our forefathers, when they came over here from Europe or from Africa, to be quite frank, we were at the bottom of the barrel. Socially speaking, we were not the aristocrats. Not one percent. He said they didn't have work over there, and they had, uh, they were suppressed, and there was no opportunities, no land. But our forefathers came over here to the bottom of the barrel, had opportunity, and got to work, and they worked hard, and they saved their money, and they had farms, and this and that. And uh, I said, and then he'd tell about how the Irish were so, so discriminated and terrible, treated terrible by the English, that I practically drove them over here. And he talked about how, how these various ethnic groups got to be in such a sad shape. And he said, now, now England did that to the Irish, but uh, you can't say that about the Italians. They did it to themselves. <laughs> he said, they've only been a country less than 100 years, and all these little principalities over there, and they're all fighting one another like this. And when they got over here, well, you wonder why we got some of them off you. I admit that's a very, very, very minor percentage of the people. But he said, this is all true about these ethnic groups, but not the Japanese. He said, before the Japanese government let them come over here, they supervised the whole thing. They would not let one Japanese person go to Modesto, California, another one to this town, three over here to San Francisco, four to Cleveland. No, no, no. It had to be at least six families, and most of the time 12, and they would set up a council and meet with them before they left, and they'd figure out which was the smartest man in there, the government would, and they say, now he's the head of the council. When you people move to Modesto and you're raising grapes or whatever it is, or peaches, and you have your own farm, you're to meet once a month now, and he'll call the meeting, and you come to his house or wherever you have it, and he's going to lay down the law for you. And you've got to follow him. If you don't, we'll bring you home. All right, now then. They picked only the best Japanese to come over here, not the criminals. They didn't want to get a bad name, the country of Japan, and so it was only the best that came. Ah, but now this consul. Then when one of the young Japanese guys begin to get rebellious against his parents, or begin to plead begin eyeing him, and he'd been uh, caught over here in a very, very minor offense. And here's a young lady who's beginning to play in show business. She thinks she'd like to be a stripper. They bring her right in to this console there and say, now, young lady, we are Japanese, and we are representing our homeland. And we don't want this low-brow type of life coming out of the Japanese. And if you persist, you go one more day in this, you're going to be sent back to Japan and you'll work the rest of your life in a rice paddy. And if the young man was rebellious and he began to do a stealing or something out of what, it set him down and say, listen, young man, you straighten up, you fly right. If you don't, in one week you'll be back over there and you'll work in rice paddies the rest of your life. You see how the sanctions they had? That was moral government, brother. That was moral government. And Due to that, he never had one person, one person, up until, even while this man was on the, on the, on the Russian State Pro, never one Japanese. You see, they had habilitated those people. They had habilitated. Now, that's more of a government. But if they started doing this, they got this. Not when they die, not next week. Now, let me tell you, now they're not like that now because there's so many of them come over here and got away from the, the authorities over there, and they're not like that anymore. But that was a, that was way that way until 1952. See, they knew something about more government. Now, I showed you that last slide to get away from the idea of enlightened self-interest. The moral government of God is not for enlightened self We saw these, and I want to go through these very quick to get to where I want to be. We 
saw that one, and we, I explained that one, and this one, and we spent quite a bit of time on that one, and we went through this one. Now, could I have somebody help me? It'll write, read that for us out loud, and then we're going to begin to discuss it. Yes, sir. <coughs> Moral government must be founded upon truth that can be perceived by the mind so that the idea of oughtness can be developed in the minds of the subject. The need for such government to guarantee the rights and well-being of all moral beings must be affirmed by the reason. Yes, it must be an intelligent thing. The man sees the right, the reasonable, and the intelligent. All right, go ahead, brother. Mm -hmm. No? See this man? He's a man from Skid Row, right? I've had them bring fellows just about like that into my office for me to give them a job. I wanted to deal out some first. <laughs> and I've said to whoever brought them, I said, wait a minute, I'm not running a rescue mission. But I began to talk to them. And they said, oh, Mr. Khan, it's hard to be a Christian. Is it? Look at that. It's hard enough to be. <laughs> you get that? I have a commencement I address I give. I only give it once because they won't let me back because of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell them it's hard. That's the name of it, hard. And I show them it's hard not to be a Christian because the consequences of man's action. It's hard. It's the worst way in the world to live separated from God, getting into all this foolishness, that you're going to start reaping the consequences one day. And then I say to them, you know, after you know something about Christ, what you have to know, it's awful hard to turn him down. And I have three points like that, that it's hard. And then, now, I've had men sit there and go, oh, Mr. Khan, you're proud to be a Christian. I said, when I look at you, friend, I don't mean to be mean. I think it's harder not to be a Christian. It's harder not to be. That's what they call it. That's why I call the final product, the end result, of these liquor ads which show the distinguished man up there and saying, clear heads choose. Yes, but that's the final product. They don't show you this in their liquor ads, do they? Otherwise, they misrepresent every liquor ad there is. I'm glad they're taken off the TV. See that car? Look at that kind of road. I had a young man call me up. He said, Mr. Khan, I work on the second ship. And I was glad to hear that somebody worked on the second ship. So <laughs> <laughs> said to me one time, Mr. Khan, how many work at WA with me? And I said, about half of them. <laughs> <laughs> Can he said, I heard you preach one Sunday morning in Nazarene Church. And he said, Mr. Khan, could I come and talk to you? I got real problems. I said, you sure can, friend. What's your name? He said, oh, you don't know me. And I said, what's your name? He told me. I said, yes, I, I, I know you. I didn't know those hundreds of mediocre ones, but I knew the very, very good workers, and then I knew the Humpty Dumpty. And he was a Humpty Dumpty. Because <laughs> his name had come up in his weekly staff meeting. So he came in to see me. And ladies, he had been a very, very handsome man at one time. No doubt about it. But there he sat. Boy, did he have his spring mom tight. Very, been very handsome. He said, Mr. Khan, I heard you speak one Sunday morning in Nazarene Church on the First Commandment. You kept emphasizing everything God's asked us to do is for our good always. Our good. You just can't. Our good. And I said, boy, you got the main point. I'm not trying to rob you of any fun. No, it's just so you get the most out of life and help your fellow man the most find fulfillment in Christ. He said, Mr. Khan, I got an emotional problem. I said, he's telling me you should have seen yeah. me. I said, well, go ahead, tell me about it. Here's his story. I won't tell you his name. He hadn't been there now, but it's fine. He'd gone forward in the church in our town, 
that specialize in what I call cheap grace and easy believism. Just accept Jesus, don't you want to go to heaven one day? Four things God wants you to know. Swallow the pill and you're in. Oh, he did that. And then he noticed this preacher. He only preached about 25 minutes on Sunday morning. And he said, boy, I'd like to have a job like that. <laughs> so he goes to California and enrolls in a theological school and become a preacher. While he's there, he begins to cheat on his wife. He had a wife and daughter. She found it out, and she left him and divorced him, and I don't blame her. Well, he began to hitchhike back to Rockford, Illinois, where the both of us live. He stopped in, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and went into an upholster sewer. That's a nightclub. Upholster sewer. <laughs> and he sat at the bar right beside a woman, evidently attractive, and he picked her up. Big deal. That's what she's there for. Who couldn't pick her up? Who could? By the way, man, you take all your wife to a bar and set her on a stool. You say, I'm here to trade, brother. And you women, you should never let a man ever do that to you. You're not very bright if you do. You don't have any more respect for a woman. Take her in those rocky, stinking places. You ought to give her freedom. But not drag her down in the mud. Well, he, this woman, he sat down beside her, and he had a nice conversation. He picked her up. Who couldn't? That's what she's there for. He did something she never thought he'd do. He brought her back to Rockford, Illinois, and then he did something else she never thought he'd do. He married her. Well, she was a real high flyer. She could spend more money than he could make. And she, he started taking those little green pieces of paper that go to the bank and sign them down in the bottom and in the right-hand corner that when you don't have money in the bank, they get real touchy about it. Did you ever notice that? Forging the odd check. He wound up in Manteno State Penitentiary for forging checks. While he was there, he evidently must have worked in a machine shop or went by when I had the window open. I don't know which. Because <laughs> he didn't know much. <laughs> Come back saying he was a machinist, but he couldn't get a job in our town. He had a record. Finally, one fellow at a place called Selectability or Availability said, there's only one firm in this town. I have mercy on you. I can get you a job there, but you better fly right. He said, where's that? He said, W.A. Goodman Corporation. And they were sitting down. We had a real born again man and personnel that hired him and had a nice talk with him. But by the way, when he got out, he found out his wife was in. Now, isn't that a nice mess of fish? She was in for, I won't say about it. She got out, came home, lived with him. She got pregnant, had a little baby. But she was a go outer. He worked the second shift, eight o'clock, he'd call home. Nobody answered the phone. He'd go home, there's the baby there by itself. She's out running around the local gym now. He got so he couldn't work the second and a half of his shift. His work record is terrible. Now if you let one guy get away with that, what happens to your place? Pretty soon they're all doing it. Pretty soon you got no company. So this is how I knew about it. So he said, Mr. Khan, I've got emotional problems. I said, yes, you sure have. I'll tell you why. I said, I've got a Chrysler out there in that parking lot. And I said, it's designed for a black top, a pavement, a macadam. It'll pass everything but a filling station. Now I said, out here in Winnebago, a country town 10 miles away, the farmer's got a farm out there, and we had four inches of rain last night. I said, if you take my car out there and start driving around that guy's field, what will happen? He said, I'll get stopped. I said, you sure will. I said, but wait a minute, out here behind this plant of ours here is a rock river. And along in late August, it gets pretty shallow into some place and you could run right across. I see you start driving my car down Rock River. Boy, he said, I'll hit a big rock. I said, you sure will. What'll happen? He said, I'll break a spring. I said, that's right. Keep on going. He said, I'll hit another rock and break a hole in the radiator. I said, what'll happen to water in the radiator? He said, well, run out. Well, what happened to the heater? The temperature of the car is way up. I said, keep on gunning. He said, oh, Mr. Connell, I'll get stuck. I said, keep on gunning. He said, I'll burn out the transmission. 
I said, keep on going. Oh, he says, I have all kinds of trouble. I said, young man, that's exactly what you're doing with your life. You're driving down Rock River with your life. You're living in sin, and God never designed you to live in sin, and you're not living natural. You're violating your very creation. And now you are getting the consequences that chickens are coming home to roost, and now you're whining about it. Why don't you straighten up and fly right and get on the right side here? Now, there's a car that'll go 200 miles an hour. Ah, but on that kind of a... <laughs> of a road. It won't through the field. Tack down Rock River, it won't go five miles an hour very long. Otherwise, God never designed man to live in sin. We're designed for the throb of holiness. And we're violating our design when we live in sin, and we can only expect the consequences of it. That's why he says, come now, let us reason together. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. That doesn't mean that God does it to you. I'm going to show you another one here in a little bit. There's a, a car going down Rock River. It's on fire. It's all bunged up. And I am going to have a question under there. I say this. What's the designer of this car doing to this car? It's on fire, it's all banged up, it won't run, it's stuck. So here's man, he goes out, drinks all that rotten old booze he can, he runs all over and gets into all kinds of trouble. Now he begins to get this disease and that disease, and he's got the shivers and the shakes and the DTs. He says, why is God doing this to me? Why, why is God doing to him? Tell me. One word. That's right, nothing. Absolutely nothing. I told him, I said, you're like a man that buys a new Cadillac and he gets a two-pound hammer and stands there and hits a block and spark plugs and uh, the distributor and the alternator and he wonders then why it doesn't run right. When the moral government of God, you're seeking to get mind and life, mind and life, at the rightness, the reasonableness of God's way, and the stupidity, the unlogical, the illogicalness, the unphilosophicalness of sin, getting to turn from that, turn to Christ, and live the way he's created for that. Now, Brother, would you go ahead and just again? Moral government is an arrangement to regulate the conduct of moral beings by enlightening their minds as to what actions are right and proper and by solemn pronouncement that certain consequences will follow right action and opposite consequences, wrong action. All right. <clears throat> Moral government therefore functions upon the principle of promising rewards for obedience and threatening appropriate punishment for disobedience. The subject is allowed to determine for himself what consequences shall be his. Go ahead. The worthiness and ability of the supreme governor must be recognized. It, is thus, it thus becomes the obligation of the supreme ruler to govern and the subjects to submit to such wise and necessary rulership. Finney defined moral government as follows. Moral government, when opposed to physical, physical government, no. Go ahead. is the government of mind in opposition to the government of matter. It is a government of motive or moral choice. Okay. In opposition to a government of force. Yeah. But God says, if you are willing and obedient, says he to go land, come on and walk with me. But if you refuse and rebel, God keeps you at arm's length, doesn't he? Now, if I keep you at arm's length, I'm governing you. I'm governing, I'm keeping you away from you. Two can't walk together unless they be agreed. Every sinner out today living in sin well, but he's being governed by God, whether he knows him or not. God's keeping him at arm's length until he gets his mind and life and sees how stupid, ridiculous sin is, how selfish it is. And if he repent of that and come to Jesus, then God will welcome him with open arms. And the two, we can become as one with him. Christ said, I and you and you and me. But if we want to remain in our rebellion, God gives his stiff arm on us. 
And God is governing the whole world today, whether they see it or not. The Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That means perceive Him in the way He's moving and what's going on today. It's hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. Why? Because sin is not natural. Not natural. He's beating on the block with a two-pound hammer. And I've often said the human mind is like a TV set. Let's see a brand new one, color set, and let's say it's got a beautiful picture, audio is very good, and I come up to it five times a day and do this, not on the tube, not on the glass, just on the side, like that, you know, like that, see, and about every fourth one you got to adjust the time, you adjust the time, all right, you keep doing that. Five times a day for seven months, and there comes a day when he can't adjust it anymore. He can't adjust. Now tell me, why won't that TV set? Why did that TV set go to pot? That's the way it's been with the human mind is. We're wonderfully and fearfully made, and every time man sins, he whacks himself a bit off like that. Every time. Get down and skid row and see those guys all talking themselves and going around humble. You know what they didn't want? We had a beautiful young girl come to work, come to our town. There was a fellow who came to work in our place. He was a real, I hate to tell you what I think, he was white. But boy, he was sure at the bottom of the barrel. This beautiful girl started going to this guy, and he gave her a lot of sweet talk, and she married him. I was asked to come to the church where they both attended, and asked me on 4th of July Sunday if I'd speak on moral law, David. I did, and I went into this thing, and it's the way the human mind is. It's like a TV set. If every time you go sin, you whack it. And then you wonder why a year later you got a pictures like that, and there's snow on there, and you got to think you're looking at a football field all the lines across there. <laughs> and I said, and I asked you, why did that TV set go? I'll tell you why, you know. It's never designed to be hit. Never designed to be used under those characteristics. And the human mind's that way, too. We're wonderfully and fearfully made, and we're fearfully. Otherwise, the mind's a very delicate thing. And every time you go out, you get in sin, and you keep on doing it, you're whacking your mind. So I noticed this girl had been so beautiful. And here she was. Now she looked like the wreck of the Hesperus. I, I was lucky that I could recognize who she was. As I went out, and I just miss him, went to the front door, and I'm shaking hands, and these are people that go out. Because there's a lot of people in that church, there's several good, real good people who work for Whitney. I want to shake hands with their family, and thank them for working for Whitney. And I often would do that, go into the shop and grab a guy and shake hands. Tell him I'm so glad he works for Whitney. It's good people like him, it makes a good company. See, companies are people, they're not building. See, it isn't factories that fail, it's, it's management that fail, and management are people. So here she came. She looked terrible. She said, Hi, Mr. Collin, you remember me? And I said, Yes, I remember you. I said, Where's Lenny? She said, Home, beat me, TV set. You get it? She got it. The trouble is, him beat the TV set, and they also reverberated Richardson and hit her. You get that? Because what we do affects everybody else around us. That's the bad part of that. The terrible part of that. Anybody with any sense could have predicted what was going to happen. Go ahead. Moral government is the influence of God's character as revealed in his work, providence, and word over the universe of moral beings. It includes whatever influence God exerts to control the minds of moral agents in conformity with the eternal principles of righteousness. <coughs> moral obligation is the binding influence of that necessity which a moral being is under of performing that action which is decisively proved to be the best action or to be the best fitted to the great end of all action on his part, uh, viz. the highest well-being of all, both of others and of himself. 
Friends, when I die, so my work. <coughs> I come on Arden Avenue, on the Chelsea, and then on the Guilford. Beautiful street, but there's a street limit there. It says 30 miles an hour. Now my car will go 64 by itself. <laughs> and let me tell you, I set that cruise control at 30 miles an hour. You know why? I have an obligation to every parent along there to watch out for their little kitties. And it, I can keep that car in control at 30 miles an hour. But if they're little kitties and I'm going 50, 60 miles an hour, they start out in front of me, I'll run over them, won't I? So I have an obligation to the parents and those children along that road that I drive. And by the way, Christians ought to be people that keep the speed limit. Because we have an obligation to those people and to ourselves do this. Now let me define obligation. There's a long definition there. But obligation is a cord that binds me to you and cords you. That binds me to my brother around the world. You see that? An obligation. That's what an obligation is. And by the way, I find that's for my good, that's for that man's good, his wife, his children, because I had a little sister, seven years of age, killed that his got her skull fractured, died the next morning, broke my mother's heart, tore up our family. I'm telling you, we have an obligation to our fellow man, and those obligations are good if we forget them. There's a third of the car. It's going down the riverbed, deep now on fire, doors falling off. Look at it, looks like the wreck of the Hesper, doesn't it? I ask you, here is a drunk, here is a, here's a man, like TV, they can't be funny unless somebody's drunk and they're making fun of that. I don't, I don't like it, they're drunk jokes, I can tell you that. As long as you do, you just encourage it. I don't like their dirty stories, I don't even listen if I can help. But those people, they go out and get into all this sin, and then when they begin to reap the consequences, oh God, why are you doing this to me? I ask you a question. What is the designer of that man of that car from Detroit? What is the designer of it who has seen that car? What's he doing to it? Nothing. Nothing. So why does man, when he begins to reap the consequences of that, say, God, why are you doing this to me? When God has given him a book, a maintenance manual, it tells him, he calls the Bible, and if he'll follow this, how to get the most out of his life, and how to help his fellow man, and how to please God, and how to lead a useful life, that's moral government, brother. The moral government of God. I remember I started off the other night, and I told you the story about the tractors. How oh, they abused our tractors down there in Louisiana, and they wouldn't even run them up. Because they were abusing them. That tractor, that's a John Deere there, by the way. I worked for them two, 13 months. By the way, never felt exploited in my life. I worked for 27 corporations in my time, and I think almost every time I was overpaid. What do you think of that? No sociologist could tell me they exploited me. Do you know you don't get rich by exploiting people? That's not the way people get rich anyway. You know one of the things that keeps many people from ever getting rich? No man can get rich by himself. He has to have other smart people that work for him, and he's got to let the other men get rich too. That keeps millions of people from getting rich. They're so penurious, they won't let anybody else make any money. You don't get rich by exploiting people. No, it isn't done like that at all. Only sociologists, <laughs> political scientists who've never been out in the business world make those kind of stupid statements. When you've been in the business world, you see how it operates. I have had many men come up to me and say, Harry, I want to thank you. You made a rich man out of me. You made a rich man out of me. I was more interested in that. I wasn't making a rich man out of me. Would you believe it? Bob, I was a millionaire once and didn't know until three years later and when I didn't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much money meant to me. It's just a means to glorify God and tell my fellow man. So therefore, when I didn't have any more, I didn't worry, oh, I shouldn't have given that again. No, 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 no. No, no. You 
See, m money's not the root of all evil. It's the love of money. It's the supreme regard for it. That's the root of all evil. So that when this worked right, it run 15 years. 15 years of just minor maintenance, change all of them, spark plugs, points, and a few things. If you treat it right, and if you live right, friends, you can have three score and ten suits and get to please God and serve Him every day. So, we'll close now. By government, we mean that arrangement which administers the supervision or exercises authority in regulating the actions of some thing or being, either by established laws or pronouncements. Now, that's what I know that I haven't talked to. <laughs> now, does anyone have any questions that I'd like to ask me? Please. Well, it's this. Surely, you must have some questions. If you don't, that means you understood everything I've said now. And speak it. These last two days. Yes, sir. Well, you know, like, you know, like, I can understand what you're saying, kind of, but, you know, like in the Old Testament, when, when God's saying, okay, you know, he comes against the end of the nation, you know, he says, okay, I'm going to throw you into captivity, I'm going to do this. And, and I know there's, you know, what he's saying. Remember I said to you, he never does anything arbitrarily. Right. What does that mean? It means just, to me, it's not on the spur of the moment, just for no reason. Well, you ought to say it better than that. He never does anything without a sufficient, intelligent reason. Okay. Sufficient, not just a reason, but sufficient, intelligent reason. He never does. By the way, when you work in scientists, in science, if you're working as a scientist, if you want to make them mad, you just accuse them of being arbitrary. They want to hit you. Maybe they couldn't even let their wife, but that was a No scientist ever wants to be accused of doing that. That means without using his head and without sufficient intelligent reason and planning behind what he does. You know why? Because he's made the image of God. By the way, until you see that, I can show you some things that you have questions in this world that you can't answer about some things that have happened unless you see that God never does it. Arbitrary. You want me to give you a good example? Boy, this is a really a jawbreaker. I was down lecturing at Mississippi State University in 1962 or 3. And I had been uh, lecturing down Jackson, Mississippi, uh, a year or so before. And as some of you know, in all my lectures, in my first one, I get my ringing witness of the saving grace of Jesus Christ in my life. And that's my only claim to intelligence, not all the colleges I went to. But one night in New York City, I got down on my knees and confessed my sins to Jesus and asked him to come in this old selfish, sinful heart and save me by his grace. And he did it. And I don't take over five minutes to do it. Well, I walked in that night into the alumni hall where all the speakers are to, are to be uh, staying and taken care of. And here sits five or six of them around there. And most of us know each other. We've been on, this is what we call the mashed potato rubber chicken circuit. <laughs> and, and most of us are professional lecturers. But here was a new guy to come in, and he was a scientist, a German scientist, only been over here about 10 years. He's probably from Redstone Arsenal. I don't remember anymore where they, you know, where they made the big ICBM in intercontinental with a missile. His name is Hein. I'm sitting there, he said, Con, in a thick German accent, I know how you're going to start out tomorrow. I've heard you. I said, fine. I'm still going to do it. <laughs> he said, well, if there's a God, as you say, why do you allow that thing to happen in my country? You know what he meant? He meant the Holocaust. The Jews going to the fiery furnace, or the gas furnace over there. By the way, let me say one thing to you. Never was six million Jews in, in Germany, Austria, Romania, and Hungary at one time. The figure's closer to a million and a half. Every year it gets bigger. Now if it's 50, it's too many. He says, why God, if there's a God, why do you let it happen? I said, were you there then? He said, yes. I said, what do you do about it? He said, nothing. He said, oh, we want God to do it. We don't do anything about it. 
Well, don't kid yourself. What if that miserable Madeline Murray O'Hare says the church didn't do anything about Hitler? Oh, yes, they did. Over a million Christians were put to death in Germany that spoke out against Hitler. And I was in three concentration camps, and in one of them, I counted 2,720 preachers been put to death in it. It's true the Catholic Church didn't stand up to them the way they should. But that doesn't mean all churches didn't. So I said, what do you do about it? He said, no. Oh. I said, I'll tell you, Heinz, if I can get you to agree with me on one thing, I can show you why that happened. And there's still a God in heaven. He said, show me. I said, would you agree with me? You as a scientist, you do anything arbitrary? Never! <laughs> you thought I'd kick him in the shit. <laughs> Never! Well, I knew him. I haven't worked it out. I know what I'm talking to. I'm, I'm not talking to the Lord, I mean. Never! Okay? If there's a God in heaven that created man, his marvelous body, and this earth and all these galaxies, the sun, the moon, the stars, all the different things, <laughs> would he do anything arbitrary? Would he? He said, no. I said, no, I can't see the question. I said, I got to start back in the garden. Why did God make man? He made man to react and respond to his love. He didn't make man to glorify him. He made him to react and respond to his love. When man gets some sense in his head and repents of his sin, then he will glorify God. But he didn't make man to glorify God. He made man to share himself with him. Share himself with man. That's why that hymn writer could say, he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own. Oh, that's why he made it. And that brings joy to God, because no one makes this cup. No button press. So I explained to him the fall of man. But when man fell, God instituted a gospel system to reconcile man. And then I said, he raised up a whole new nation out of Abraham, a nation from which his son, the Redeemer, is going to come. And I led him across the Red Sea and up into the Promised Land and up to Calvary. And I said, now here, God's plan is complete. Jesus says it's finished. And I said, at the very tomb, the Jews lied. They said, somebody comes stole his body away, didn't they? And I said, they've been lying ever since. I had a Jewish roommate. And it's his favorite swear word was Jesus. I wasn't even a Christian. I said to him one day, Harry, I said, I'm not a Christian, but I was raised in a good family. If you don't stop talking the way you do, you're either going to move out of this room or I'm going to move out. I will not room with a foul-mouthed person like you that drags the name of Christ. My mother loves him. He has lost our family. I'm not a Christian, but I won't allow him my room. He said, okay. He was raised in a Jewish orphan's home, and that's the first swear word they learned from Jesus. It's the first swear word that I said, you cut it out. Did you ever see a Hollywood movie that ever portrayed the gospel right? No, you didn't. You never will. You know who controls that? So I said, right there, they began to harm the gospel and do everything they could. And Jesus even told his disciples they'd be killed too. Is a servant above his master, as much as a prophet they, they don't love God. That's why Jesus even, and they even changed it from observing the Sabbath, they changed it one day over to the Lord's day because Jesus didn't want new life in Christ mixed up with his synagogue. <laughs> that old dead legalistic Judaism, he didn't want them mixed up no way, shape, or form. Don't you put new wine, no bottle. That's the main reason for us worshiping on Lord's Day. That's the main reason. God didn't want them confused in any way. If Jews wanted to believe, fine. Eleven of the twelve apostles did believe. They're Jews. And if it came to them first, didn't mean that God, they were more precious to God, but that's the way it had to start. Well, I said to him, I said, now, we just admit it. You did. That God... If there is a God who created the heavens and the earth, and man, he wouldn't do anything arbitrary. Now that same God has said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Otherwise, one soul is worth more than this whole physical world. 
right? All right, now I say. Here they are. There's a million six hundred thousand. We're not repenting their sins, not embracing the Savior, the Mashiach, as they would call him. No, no, no. They're not repenting. They're not coming to our truth. They're not coming to our God. Now, if God delivers them, he's going to turn these million six loose on the world to keep on hindering the gospel, and a lot of people are going to lose their souls, right? All right? If you want God to intervene and... Say that million six hundred Jews, you've got to give God a sufficient, intelligent reason. And if the if the gospel is important as God says it is, and a human soul is worth more than the whole world, you give me one reason why God should have intervened and delivered them, and not let them get into the yes, Give me one. I said, Come on, Heinz, give me one. And you think of all the people. As Jesus said, you encompass land and sea to make one proselyte, making seven times more the child of hell. I said, tell me, why should he intervene? The human soul is that important. Give me one reason. You know what this scientist says? He says, I can't. I can't. But if I didn't believe that God never does anything arbitrarily, I couldn't have answered these questions. It's God that says, I'm no respect of person. Seven times. And no little boy blue head. Hebrews 2, or Romans 2, 6 through 10. And I'm going to stop. But here, would you go that pretty face there? Will you please? I'll close with this. Let me read to you Romans 2. Romans 2, 6 through 10. Speaking of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. That's what it is. But unto them that are contentious, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they'll get indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, the Jew first, and also the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and all to, so to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. I'm so glad he's that way. There's no little boy blue favor. And every time better obey that, just as much as anybody's telling you here. God who only wants to give it to them. And as Moses says, I call heaven, heaven and earth and cord this day against you. I've set before you life and death. Blessing, mercy. Therefore choose life that both thou and I see may live. Now I can't choose eternal life for my kids, but they're sure affected very much by it. And when they see it, <coughs> the wholesomeness and the winsomeness of Christ in their mother and in their daddy, they want it too. I got three kids and all of them love God and serve him with all their heart, mind, and soul. Because they were raised on Friday and Saturday around our house. My wife would say, and I would, oh goody, we get to go to Sunday school. We get to go to church tomorrow. It was not an interruption of our life of selfishness. It just is our life. You get that? Therefore, the children's thought is a joyful thing to us. We didn't work. We didn't grind at it. This is what we were made for. And then you know something? My kids are the same way right now. They're the same. My daughter is such a great singer. On a Monday, she teaches black people how to read. On Tuesday, she works in a place that's out working against abortion. Man, she thought we were walking around the room. <laughs> Quit murder. Wednesday, she works in a home for unwed mothers. Free for all of that. And she'll sing with the pastor in the old folks' homes when he goes around to preach at them. And she will sing for him. And she sings like a bird. She didn't get a dime for it. She just does it because of the love of Christ. And the love of the service to Jesus Christ. There's there's pleasure in every sin you can mention, but the only real joy in this world is serving the Lord. Isn't that right? Brother David, 